Um, so I can start off by introducing myself here. My name is Johan Jorgensen. I come from Stockholm, Sweden, one of the hubs for the global food revolution. And uh, I think I'm here basically to share a bit on what Stockholm and Sweden is doing in the terms of building a food tech hub. And with me here today, Katie, to my left, from your right. Hey, how's it going? I don't know, is this working? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, really excited to... Can you can hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm Katie Waksberger. I'm a co-founder of Dana. We are an Abu Dhabi-based venture builder and investment platform for women-led startups in agri-tech, food tech, energy, water solutions, and circular economy. Uh, always exciting to speak with our counterparts from Europe. I know they have a lot to, to learn, uh, to teach us and to learn from us. Absolutely and, to learn. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, to have these conversations in this forum with so many people who I know are coming from the F&B space. Uh, you know, ag tech and food tech really is, is, isn't anything if we're not having a conversation with the end users and the consumers. So I hope that this... Uh, fireside chat can be interactive. Let's do that. And Eric, of course, you're the guy uniting everything here from the UAE, or you live here in Dubai, but you're from Switzerland, and you work with them. It's really fun. You're present in Sweden, so I'm like, God, where are you not? <laughs> yeah, so my, my name is Eric Sieber. We manage uh, food tech venture capital funds, investing in seed and series A uh, in Europe, in Israel, in the US. And now we're looking actively also in this region uh, to, to establish ourselves here. And we really invest in scalable technology um, that improves both impact-wise but also return invested capital. So lovely. So, so I have, uh, you know, also the, the uh, you know, capability to use myself. So I run something called Sweden Food Tech. And our goal is to change the food system within one generation, which we must. And we're trying to do that by first changing Sweden and Stockholm, and then having those results replicate. Mostly we're an advisory firm, but we also do a lot of other things such as governmental you know, projects together with them, working with the entrepreneurs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, two pieces of promotions here. Um, I brought with me a bunch of copies of the recent Stockholm Food Tech Guide laying it out in slightly more details, what we're trying to do, what we're achieving. I'll put them up by the coffee table over there so you can grab a copy if you want to. And if you're heading out to the expo in the next few days, we're running a series of talks in the Swedish pavilion, evening times, uh, starting today and until Sunday, where you'll meet a bunch of cool entrepreneurs as well. So, Eric, let me start by asking you, what makes or constitutes a really good food tech hub? Yes, yeah, so I think you have to make the difference between where the innovation comes from and where the scaling up happens, right? So, um, in food tech, there's not yet one country or one region which is leading, like Silicon Valley, you know, for IT or, or Boston and Switzerland for like, life sciences. And so, what, what we see is that um, innovation comes where the industry is there and the new industry comes in. So, a couple of examples. Switzerland is leading in um, systems. So because you have Nestle, Nespresso, you have the whole technology, um, uh, the food, the mechanical engineering, the watch industry, we are very good with all the systems like coffee machines and stuff like that. However, Sweden is very good with anything natural. Norway is very, very good with aquaculture, as is Thailand, right? And so to establish real innovation, you need to have the industry and the universities there. However, scale up, I think, is a different thing. And this is where you know, Dubai, UAE, um, Singapore, etc., come in, where they can really import technology, but then scale them up. You agree with that, Katie? I do, generally. I mean, I'm just curious, because uh, you're based here in the UAE, but your, your you know, expertise is from Switzerland, and also you have engagement with uh, Peakbridge. I mean, you're part of Peakbridge in Israel. Founder, yes. Um, so, I'm curious if you think that the UAE has uh, the various elements that you just referred to to be an innovation hub for food tech, you know, given the increased emphasis on food security now and that there's uh, a need to, to find different ways to generate produce and uh, manufactured foodstuffs here. So, what I meant before is that 
um, I think if you have a company that has developed, let's say, I don't know, let's take Infarm, which has hydroponics, just to make an example. For them to scale up here, I think makes sense. But there is not yet, I mean, you have to have a specific sector. Let's take Israel. Israel is very good in cybersecurity and IT. So anything IT going to food is amazing. They're very good in um, water with agriculture, right? The whole drip feeding and whatever, because that's the university, that's their know how. And then founders come out of the university, they come out of the army and create these things. In the UAE, you don't have that yet. You don't have very specialized university, but they're building. So you have to attract talent. There's very few, let's say, Emirates of people living here who come with innovation. You attract them to come here and do it. Right? I, I agree with you on the importance of like academia and research in, in contributing to the growth of these sectors. I think that, um, I mean, if you look at the growth and the investment happening here around academia and like bringing more experts, you know, at the same time, I, I think it's a, a gentle balance between um, research and, and also having corporate involvement. I think that, you know, just from our experience at Dana, um, you know, if you want to bring new ideas into the market, you have to have corporate design partnerships. And this has been something for us here in the UAE that has been uh, relatively difficult to cultivate because, uh, you know, the, the corporate environment needs to be set up to accommodate innovation and new ideas and and you know they have to be willing to invest capital and time in something that might fail which is not really part of the corporate culture in most parts of the world yet i, I think this is pretty interesting I, I think we need to go back you know, to what eric is saying as well to what is the founding or you know the foundation that we're standing on if i can talk a little bit about sweden you know absolutely zero food culture we eat porridge or you know parts of trees and stuff in order to survive. That's the history. And then we, we started to do every other thing we could but for food. So big industries, telecom, etc. And then uh, we realized that, okay, when you look at the next gen food system, it's different from the current food system. Oh, we have another guest here Hi, coming up on stage. <laughs> Lovely to have you here. Uh, wonderful. We'll introduce you in a short second. Uh, and um, and the thing is, you know, what's driving the next gen food system is stuff such as health and sustainability, which are the two new official religions of Sweden. And uh, and of course, then you have tech, uh, which is super important wherever you go, not the least within food. And then you have, you know, the access to capital, and not the least, very mature and change-minded consumers. And that paired with active policy making makes for such a great sandbox that can build the next gen food system and hence also the next gen food big companies which will not be the same ones 15 years from now that we have today so so and then the question is how do you build those parts of the uh, the puzzle out there in the world how do you connect them and here I mean like Stockholm can connect some I mean Switzerland does connect some but Dubai is a super connector of the world so that's a role that Dubai can take connect and scale uh, but now it's not about me anymore <laughs> who are Hi, you <laughs> I use mine. Okay. so is this the right panel this is a different view. <laughs> We're having a fireside chat. Okay, fine. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. I was meant to talk about investment in women uh, food tech businesses. My name is Triska Hamid. I'm the editor of WAMDA. WAMDA is an entrepreneurship ecosystem enabler across the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I head up all the kind of like the research and, and the platform side of things. Then you absolutely come to the right place. Okay. So uh, tell us a bit more. What, what's, your, what's your point when it comes to food? I love it. <laughs> um, You're in good company today. <laughs> can you be a tad bit more specific? I can talk about the investments in food, how the food tech landscape has changed. No, I, th I think the point here is like, so how can we turn, how can we build Dubai into one of the great food tech hubs of the world? What should Dubai bring to the table that I would mean, resonate with everyone else? They've already started. They're building the, the food tech um, city, essentially. That, so I don't know whether you guys have already spoken about this. Not yet. the food tech city, but it sounds really interesting. Yeah, so they're, they're building, um, you know, t typically like you have education city, um, whatever. So now there's going to be a food tech city and it's going to house all the kind of key players of the food uh, ecosystem. And there's a big focus on innovation and food tech startups, all the way from agri-tech to food delivery. 
That's wonderful. But where is that situated? In Dubai. In the, where in Dubai? You know, I, I need to know where to buy my next no, no. apartment. <laughs> Stop putting me on the spot. <laughs> I don't know exactly where, but I'm sure it's strategically <laughs> placed. Uh, okay, that, that's. I mean, I think it's super cool, and, and also building a city. By the way, you know, guys, uh, we're expanding the the mass of urbanity on planet Earth with something like 50 percent over the next two to three decades. That's kind of amazing. We need to think food in connection with that, right? Don't we? So, so, but, but Eric, uh, what would you say about starting a food tech company here in Dubai compared, or, or running a food tech company here in Dubai rather than running it elsewhere in the world? What is the, what is the good points? Yeah, so I think uh, Dubai and the UAE in general has an amazing business philosophy, right? So create a company here uh, to establish it, and it's the really network between Africa, Middle East, and Asia, it's it's the real hub, right? So I think this is this is what you do. For example, we have one entrepreneur actually here who is, who is Mike, who is from a Swiss company, revolutionizing the water industry in the food service business. Now it is Swiss space, but if you want to attack these markets, you have to establish here in Dubai, right? And that's what I meant with scaling up. I think it's an amazing p place to scale up. Also, some I thought some some numbers are interesting, and maybe money is also part, of course, of innovation, right? So the food industry spends 0.4 percent of revenue in R&D, 0.4, where the IT industry spends 12, okay? The, the biggest 10 food companies, only three spend R&D, the rest is zero. So, of course, money is important, and now the VC industry last year spent about $40 billion, where the food industry spent $2 billion in innovation. And this will change the game, and that's where I think Dubai comes in, like this accelerator like you, like these food cities like you, where you have money, you have VCs, but you need the corporate partners, you need universities, and you need the entrepreneurs. And how to put this together, that's, that's the challenge, I think. What do you say, Katie? Do you think, where do you think Dubai or, or UAE will be 10 years from now? I mean, I, I agree with everything that Eric said, and I would also add that, you know, so we engage a lot with companies in the agri space, and there are so many challenges around resource scarcity, around, you know, what it means to actually grow food in the desert, and in so many cases, we find ourselves sort of coming back to the same point that it might actually make sense to grow food in labs here, as opposed to grow food in fields. Um, and obviously, that's not across the board. We have to have some kind of mix of both in the end of the day. But when it comes to actually manufacturing food stuff, especially when we're talking about growing meat in petri dishes, or we're talking about you know engineering new kinds of protein through algae or through um, you know uh, insects. These are type of things that, you know, Dubai might actually be an ideal place to do some of this work. Um, and obviously, you know, we have challenges of uh, energy and resource scarcity everywhere here in the GCC. But this is like something, this is a puzzle that we're going to need to figure out uh, how, how we create the most amount of nutrients with the least amount of energy and the least amount of resources. And we see, I mean, globally, the investment in agri-tech and food tech is uh, increasing exponentially. Here in the region, it's, 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 in the region, it's still uh, trying to catch up. And I think you know, some of that has to do with uh, awareness among consumers and, and generally like the, the lack of uh, funding and VC infrastructure in these sectors. But it's definitely changing. And, and I think, I, I mean, I personally see a lot of potential around you know, what we can manufacture in, in the lab. Can I add to that? Point? Absolutely. The, we, we're seeing more and more agri-tech startups emerge that are now going further afield. So Red Sea Farms is one. It's based in Saudi Arabia, and they grow um, crops in seawater. And now they've just launched in the US. Uh, and that came out of Kaust in Saudi Arabia. Pure Harvest also expanding. Started out here, you know, growing tomatoes in, in a smart farm, smart greenhouse. There is the potential, there's also the governmental drive to enable food security in the region generally. But what's difficult here for food tech startups is typically what all startups face, which is the really high cost of doing business here. It's not cheap to start a business, full stop. I think Dubai, according to the World Economic Forum, is the most expensive city in the world to start a business. And when you are in the agribusiness, you have incredibly high electricity costs. This is not subsidized. Um, access to water. They're, they're, startups are treated like any other business. So the corporates and the startups will be treated exactly the same. There's been some changes. So now they, they've um, introduced a 9% uh, tax 
on profits, which might level the playing field a bit um, and maybe reduce the license fees, but we have to wait and see. Well, of course, I'm like starting back to Eric's comments about Dubai as being the place to scale stuff rather perhaps than, than start stuff. Uh, I, I must ask you guys, because I'm not familiar with this, this region at all, but one thing that frustrates me constantly when it comes to uh, being in Europe is, of course, the regulatory framework or burden that we have around. For instance, it was only recently that insects were allowed for human food. I mean, we're talking months ago, right? So, so it's now, literally, that happens. Lab-grown food, totally out of the picture. Won't happen for a million years, I think, in Europe. Uh, 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 but yet, those are the areas where we see things are happening. And I know that we, we, we talk about, you know, I, I, I do speak sometimes with a guy called Josh Tetrick, who's the founder of Eat Just. Uh, and they started up in Singapore, uh, because that's, that's the first place where they were allowed to serve the lab grown stuff. And now they're looking at this region. So where do you think the policy makers here, uh, what will they do in order to enable this development? Are they already, perhaps? I just I can say you're completely right. I think regulation is actually one competitive advantage that the UAE could use, right? And when you talk to Her Excellency Miriam, um, they, for example, had to change legislation for hydroponics to make it a farm because it was not a farm, so you couldn't actually get a permit, right? So I do think if they have the speed to do that, like lab grow meat to be the first to unregulate or whatever, then I think you have a regulatory advantage, which which could be something very interesting. And the UE with this kind of top-down management of these things could actually do that. Where Switzerland never in 60 years, as you say, uh, will do something like this. It's too complex. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that um, things can move quicker here, given the structure of, of how decisions are made. And I, I just want to point to the fact that, you know, as a, a venture builder, like we work with a lot of founders and we find that the talent in this country is incredible. Like so many people from the region who are looking for opportunities or who are looking to build you know, a, a future for themselves and their families end up here in the UAE. And um, in the end of the day, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I want to engage with the audience a little bit. Does anyone here, uh, is anyone here an entrepreneur? That's good. Okay, awesome. So, would uh, raise your hands if you have felt throughout your journey as an entrepreneur more than twice in the past month that you want to quit, that you're just done with it. Okay. <laughs> so, I think in the end of the day, like we're talking about innovation, we're talking about bringing new ideas into this world. It's like. It's like birth, right? It's like actually all of the pain of you know pushing something out into the world. It's crazy, and anyone who who you know puts themselves into that situation has to be like a little bit insane. But I think you know there's so many people in this country who came here so that they can do that because they have an idea and they have aspiration, they have motivation, and they saw this place as you know, the only place that, that they're really able to, to have that opportunity and, and to make that dream a reality. So, you know, we have regu regulatory challenges and we have the challenges of corporate design partnerships and, you know, costs and all of that. But in the end of the day, the talent here, just from my experience, is incredibly rich and motivated and inspiring. And I think that, you know, we're going to see, I mean, we've already seen it explode in terms of the, the number of entrepreneurs here. And uh, I'm just waiting to see, you know, more of you guys jumping on the food tech and agri-tech bandwagon. Do you see a lot of good cases coming out of this region that it are, have an international potential in the world of food? There are, there are always. Um, I mean, increasingly, if we look at the startup ecosystem about 10 years ago, um, virtually non-existent, and most startups would copy ideas from abroad. Um, and they had a very kind of local mindset. That has shifted in the past few years. Um, particularly, I mean, if you look at the Lebanese ecosystem, which should have died, it's still, there's still a, a glimmer of hope because what's happened is a lot of the startups either relocated or they shifted their focus away from the Lebanese market and GCC to international. And that kind of pushes, it, it balances things out because those 
who are good enough to survive and to um, attend to a global audience will do so. And the ones that would have failed probably fail sooner. And, that, and that's better for the whole ecosystem. But in terms of ideas that we see in food tech, this part of the world is still very much consumer driven. So a lot of the startups that emerge are in the services sector. Um, I mean, the largest round that was raised last year was um, in the food, well, generally, it was Kitopi. So Kitopi is an operator of cloud kitchens uh, in the Middle East. And prior to the pandemic, they went to New York, they went to London, and then the pandemic um, decimated those plans. But now they're going to, the um, I think, Singapore. Uh, they've expanded across the region. And in terms of what we're seeing in the food tech space, it is very much still the uh, cloud kitchens where we're seeing most growth. Um, and you know alternatives of food delivery. In terms of agri-tech, it's still in the very early stages. We're not seeing the kind of innovation that you'll see in Singapore, in Europe, or the US. Okay, but that's happening. I mean, like when you look at Singapore, for instance, they're, they're, they're actually updating their strategy. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They have their 30 by 30 uh, strategy for food. So by 2030, they will produce 30% of their food within their own borders. And mind you, of course, Singapore is not a big place, uh, lacks agricultural land. So, uh, but you know, when, when you talk to them, they say, no, that's defensive, we need to go further. So, uh, so they're, they're upping the ante in a, in a way. And when, when, when you think about food security, no, I think it's an easy bridge to be, to be built between Singapore and, and Dubai, probably, for a lot of that knowledge transfer. Are you working with international hubs here in the world of food? Have you built those bridges? Oh, we are, but, but mostly in the developing world. Like, uh, in terms of engagement with the talent and with the, uh, with the markets, we're more focused on Egypt, Africa, and India, um, because, mostly because of the climate similarities. Like, I think that you know, in terms of scaling and partnerships and, and, and joint uh, R&D or proof of concept, it's really important for us that our partners share sort of the desert challenges. I'll tell you something that's, sorry to cut you off, but um, that's quite optimistic. 10 years ago, you had these countries buying land in places like Kenya to grow food for themselves. Now they're looking at how do we use technology to grow our own food on our own land. So the mindset has completely changed. I think it's I think it's vital to have a mind change shift here, right? Because I think my own experience when it comes to Sweden was that the biggest shift happened when when suddenly people realized that food isn't about the traditional food value chain anymore. There are new food value chains to be built, and then suddenly you have new players coming in, such as the big tech companies, the telcos, the insurance companies, the robotics manufacturers, etc. And suddenly you open up new venues for this, and also strategically thinking when it comes to policy making. And suddenly you could you could realize that building your own food security, yeah, we can do that. I mean, Sweden, we import 50% of all our food. And, and if we were to eat anything that we grow ourselves, it would be oats. That would be it. Potatoes, perhaps, sometimes. But that's it, right? <laughs> and if I look in my area in Stockholm, where I live, the self-sufficiency of vegetables is 1%, which is absolutely silly, right? Uh, I mean, Eric, where, where do you think this is heading now for, for a place such as Singapore? Will they be able to, or you guys be able to produce all the food? So I, I know Singapore quite well. I used to live there when I worked for, for Nestle. And I see what they did. You know, they have Temasek, which is their sovereign fund, like here with ADQ. Um, how they did the life science industry and now how they do the food industry. I think it's a great example for Dubai. But I also want to say this, um, as a VC, as an investor, is one view. And then, of course, as a government, there's a different view, right? I think you can, with regulation and also protecting, like Switzerland protects its agriculture industry, actually create an industry like hydroponics. Hydroponics does not make money in general, right? We, I would not invest in hydroponics right now. Maybe in technology for hydroponics, but not in hydroponics. But of course, if you say in 10 years, you know, all the, I don't know, salads have to be local, then you create the industry because the prices are increased and you can make money, right? And that's what Singapore does with the, with the shrimps. It's an American company which produces now shrimps on land, right? And it's fantastic. It's really good. And so I think there's these different views to that, how, how to do that. And food safety, as you said, with COVID, I think everybody realized having land in Africa doesn't matter if you cannot import it and export it, so you have to do it here. And this is a political, strategic decision by a country. We have it in Switzerland, Singapore does it now, and Dubai probably should do it Can as I well. Can I ask you a question? Is that okay? 
Sure. So um, when, you when you look to invest in technology that you think can only be profitable once the regulatory uh, constraints sort of catch up with it, do you make any predictions? Like if, if there's a solution that you think, okay, well, when waste management becomes more expensive or when, uh, you know, when it costs more money to dispose of these kinds of materials, this product is going to be like in the right place at the right time. How do you make those predictions? All right. So let's take uh, new proteins, which I think we all know. There's plant-based protein and there's the synthetic kind of meat protein, right? So I think plant-based protein is, has no regulatory hurdle in that sense. It's interesting, um, but it's usually processed food, which is unhealthy and tastes bad, right? So there we don't invest in these products, but invest in technologies that make it taste better and make the ingredients list natural so it becomes a clean label product, for example. And this is an Israeli company which is really interesting in this. Now on clean meat, we have decided, so clean meat I think is really interesting, but it will take 15 to 20 years to actually produce it. So you have to know that if you do clean meat, a cell needs a certain medium to grow. That medium has to have growth factors. Right now, we take them out of embryo from cows, which is kind of defeating the purpose and very expensive. So some company like Mosa Meat work on non um, thing. But then once these cells are grown, you have to grow them industrially at cost of goods for the food industry, not the pharma industry, right? And if you look at these fermenters, they have to be producing in sterile. One microbe and you can throw it away, right? And this is, you're not in the pharma industry, you're in the food industry. And then comes the regulatory hurdle. So I think actually in this sector, China will be the driving market because again, they can do top down. They need meat, they need protein, and it's not going to be Europe or the US. But we have not invested because I don't think you can have an exit in three to five years because it will take 15 to 20. Politically, scientifically, and to solve the world's problem, I think it's huge. I look more at fish because I think fish like salmon or cod, cod is extremely expensive and there's almost none left. There it's much easier to do synthetic meat than synthetic, uh, synthetic like fish than meat with fat and all of these things. So long answer to short questions, right? Thanks. No, but I think, I think you're absolutely right. You, you can predict also where, where this is heading. I mean, we all see it. You know, so food is, the current food system is killing the planet and everyone on it slowly but very efficiently. I mean, like two thirds of you in this room, statistically speaking, will die prematurely from a, you know, a disease that you caught from your bad food habits. So, so do you want to do that? No? It's lovely. So, so we'll, we'll have to <laughs> fix it, right? So, uh, so we need to fix these big mega problems and the entrepreneurs will do that. One more thing I wanted to say is actually what is interesting is who cares about Europe anyway? Europe is 300 million people, right? Where emerging markets are probably something like 5 billion people, right? And when we talk about food tech, we always talk about the high number one, top one projects with high margin niche products. At the end of the day, what we have to resolve is the food crisis in emerging market. And that means, you know, products that everybody can afford and are nutritional, healthy, and sustainably produced. Now that's the real challenge. We as VCs can only invest in the top 1% where innovation comes and then hope that the scale up actually creates then the volume and the cost of goods that you know, will resolve the real problem. I think it's also not just about um, what's affordable for consumers, but it's also about what's affordable to manufacture and generate. So when you look at, when you look at like the uh, developing markets where you have increasingly you know, growing populations and a lot of food crises that are already persistent. Um, you know, if, if, there's a, if you're trying to grow cells in a lab, if that's something that you need to ultimately educate the population to do locally, um, like, you know, we have to invest ultimately in, in solutions that are not only affordable, but are also like easily transferable in terms of the knowledge to, to manufacture them or to grow them. Like if we have, uh, if we're gonna rely on um, creating enough food for everyone through uh, drone farming, that, that might not be something that's actually realistic because most of the farmers in the Middle East might not have you know, the time or the background to learn to operate drones. So I think that there's uh, that aspect as well. But, but okay, I think this is interesting because it also points to the fact that we're moving food away from things that is labor intense and land intense to something that is capital and technology intense. So, so that also means that you can shift stuff. And I'm like, you mentioned what I think it was kind of a brilliant one, was you talked about the desert climates. Well, take a look at the future of the planet Earth. It is a desert climate. So you can use that to your advantage. If you can fix stuff here, that can be easily exported to the rest of the world, because they will need that. That was pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, no, I think it's realistic, uh, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I mean, we, we made an intentional decision to invest in desert tech really for that reason. I think deserts are becoming a growing reality in our world, and we should know how to harness the potential of the desert as opposed to fear the desert. But at the same time, um, I think part of engaging with the desert is about cultivate, recultivating the land. And when we talk about agri-tech, it's not only hydroponics and indoor farming. Sometimes agri-tech is a new molecular uh, combination uh, for a compost solution that will sequester carbon and allow us to grow a new crop. So I think that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if the future is tech and capital intensive as opposed to land intensive and resource intensive. I think it's a combination of both. And we need to find ways to uh, utilize the massive amounts of space that we have in this region. I mean, in, in Egypt, there's a lot of, not a lot, but quite a few startups that are looking at water management solutions. So this part of the world, MENA, wastes the most amount of water for its farming. I think in, in, uh, in the UAE, it's something like 80% of the uh, potable water is, is wasted on farming. Not wasted, but uh, it could be used more efficiently. Um, and they don't really have that much of a reserve. So it's, if that dries out, then you're well, all going to die. Do, yeah. <laughs> or move. Even before we die of diseases, right? <laughs> um, so we are saying, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's a whole ecosystem. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the food we eat will be grown in a lab. It means how do we do as much as we can with the resources that we currently have? And it depends on where you are in the region. In Egypt, they do have more arable land, um, but it's access to water that's the difficulty. So you're seeing innovation around that. Um, here, obviously, growing for a desert uh, environment, which also will need water or different use the use of water will have to change. Isn't it pretty cool? But, you know, one of the coolest things I actually saw in the world of food tech is a Japanese super scientist uh, from the Sony CSL Computer Science Labs in Tokyo bringing up something called Cineco culture, where they co-cultivate hundreds of plants in the same space and achieve hyper productivity, which can take you know those cracked clay fields that you see in Africa back to an edible jungle within six months. So I mean, like there are a lot of practices to, to your point that can be used in, in traditional agriculture. But what we've done with systems is, of course, force everyone out there to to go for massive industrialized processes in order to produce food. And that's one of the challenges, of course, to but go I away think, from that. I think the, the main challenge when it comes to the kinds of solutions that you're talking about is, uh, is a challenge of financing. Because when it comes to investing in agri-tech solutions that are either um, simpler or you know, more sort of uh, farmer-oriented, farmer there are a lot of challenges in terms of proving the concept and um, actually like, you know, bringing it into the market. But that, I mean, like, investing in food production must be one of the sta most stable forms of incomes from your capital. I mean, it probably won't hit the big, you know, 100x's always, but it will every year return to you. Uh, it must be a fantastic thing to put all the wealth that's in this, this room and outside here in Dubai to work. Uh, you, you're nodding here, Eric, and, 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 and I mean, it's, it's yeah, your yeah. hypothesis here that, that this is the place where we can scale and finance the, the transformation of the largest sector in the yeah, world. Yeah, I mean, again, an example. So we invested in a company called Evie. They actually use the algae to produce lipids, omega-3, and uh, a protein, which is a vegan protein, which is as rich as uh, egg or meat. So it's an amazing amino acid profile. They developed the technology in Israel, but they went to the US for regulatory purposes, actually, to make the industrial factory. So it's a factory in the desert, uses the three S's, so sand, sun, and water, salt water from, from the ground. Now, if the UAE would have been at that time already with the food strategy, they could have gone actually here, because it's the same and then exported, right? So, so this is what I mean. So it's amazing technology, but then scale up is really where you need the money, you need the regulation, and you need the space and ease of business. And that I do think the UAE can offer. So that, that I think is really interesting. That's cool. So, so how do you, by the way, I don't know how much time we have left, or we have like we're just chit chatting so here until someone stops us. So. <laughs>
Oscar's not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good question. Anyone in the audience? Oh, keep on, they say here. Keep on, keep should on. We, we okay, so you don't know what you're saying, Oscar, when you say keep on. Uh, <laughs> should, we, should we open it up to the audience to see if they've got questions? Maybe? Yes, let, let's go out. Let's venture out in the audience with the microphone so we can hear you properly. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ali. I'm from India, and I've been in uh, food manufacturing and been servicing uh, people like uh, uh, flight kitchens, ship galleys, and stuff like that. And uh, of late, we have ventured into a cloud kitchen, and I saw a huge gap. And we launched during the pandemic, and in a period of say 20 months, we were able to uh, scale up our revenue and uh, profitably substantially. Um, my question is that I saw a huge gap in the uh, food safety and food security part of it. So that got me thinking along with working my business, which we are currently present in three cities in India. Um, now I'm planning to set up the cloud kitchen over here in Dubai. So we have a very ambitious plan to grow this part of the world. But along with this, I also saw an opportunity in the food tech space where um, there, is a, there is an idea that is available with us, which we are working and developing on, on collecting a lot of data points as we are actually preparing the food and compiling that into a very small QR code, which gives us a very, very uh, strong, definitive way of ensuring that the food is uh, prepared safely and securely. And the same information can be validated through a blockchain. So this is a technology that you're working through. What I want to know is that um, it came, it came to, for me to make a decision whether I want to do the business or uh, pursue the business of uh, the food or pursue the business of the food tech. So I've taken the one that would give me the money first. So that's the reason we're setting up the cloud kitchens over here, and, uh, here in uh, the GCC region. My question is, from a food, the, the food tech uh, perspective of the business, how do we actually set up a business over here, and what are the resources available for us to go go for this? Eric, uh, you have to invest in this company in one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's your take, Eric? Uh, please go ahead, or or any of you up there. So what what is it? What is it that you should invest in here? Is it the food or is it the tech? That's, again, so for me as a venture capital, we have decided from our model that we invest in proprietary, scalable technology and not in food, meaning we actually don't invest in the next organic, whatever, orange drink. Uh, we only invest technology, so data, so we have investment in two companies which use data, AI, sensors, because that's really scalable, very interesting, and the food industry is producing almost without data today, right? Olive oil is still pressed the way it was pressed, you know, 100 years ago, so we have to change, we have to forecast, we have to do these things. So we think from a return investor capital, the tech part is really interesting. However, politically, for the UAE, that's a different question, right? Uh, pure harvest, which I know very well, it is tech, right? But at the end of the day, it's a tomato, right? So that's, so that's my answer. That's a really that's a really good answer. I mean, like, it's hard to, to understand exactly which part of the business. I see, I, and I meet a lot of entrepreneurs having that issue. What, what am I running actually? So you have to decide, I guess. But I think it's um, it's also a, a question of which what market you're investing in. So I think that uh, if we look at the kind of uh, VCs that are putting capital into places like Africa, in a lot of cases, they're actually investing in the products, not in the tech. So, uh, and the scalability is in the, the, the produce itself or, you know, whether it's a packaging house or a logistics solution. I, I think it really depends on, on the market and the model of scalability really will just change depending on wh whether you're trying to expand to the US or whether you're looking to bring a solution to uh, the subcontinent or to Africa. I think that's a really good point, Katie. Any other questions here in the audience? We have one here. We ha oh, you have the and mic have already. Money. Very good. Okay. You're prepared. Ready. prepared. So I'm with a company in Abu Dhabi called Star Lab Oasis, and we're looking at outer space, food, and agriculture. And one of the things that I've experienced in Abu Dhabi is the incredible amount of diversity uh, from many different countries. And, and you know that's also something that is exciting about food is you know many different cuisines and many different cultures bring their own uh, perspective. Sorry, yes. Um, did you hear the first part? Okay. Can um, many different cultures and cuisines bring their own takes of, of food to, to the table? And so, no pun intended. But how can we make sure that we're taking uh, most advantage of, of all the different cuisines and all the different diversity that's present in the UAE in terms of making sure that this is you know, a food culture that, that is um, accessible to all different countries? Thank you. 
One of the big questions out there, I mean, like, the, all the, how can we utilize all the massive inputs from the food, ma various food cultures that you can find here? It's actually amazing when you venture out in the city as a foreigner to see all the, all the availability here. It, it's totally massive. And of course, that builds on a lot of knowledge, you know, that, that's inherent in, in those, those food cultures and those foods. Uh, I don't know how have how, yeah. Do you want to answer that one? It's, um, it, it's a good one. I mean, like you can see, it, a lot of knowledge is present. How do you harvest that knowledge? I think I, it's an interesting question. I'm caught a little bit off guard by it because I've never thought about cuisines as bringing like different innovative approaches. It's interesting. Um, I would say that I think that the diversity of the UAE is. An, an incredible advantage to any startup that's looking to you know, be based here. And that diversity, I hadn't thought of it in terms of cuisine, that's really cool. But um, specifically in terms of you know, the different societies and different economies that people are coming from and the different sort of um, patterns of thinking. And you know, when you have a, a founding team with people, some of them are from a developing economy, some of them might be from Europe, some of them might be uh, local and then when you bring that together you can really come up with interesting solutions specifically in terms of the business model But Kate, I do have a take on this because you know one of the things that we have experienced when it comes to development here is the the role of the chefs uh, They're totally underappreciated in the world uh, when it comes to development stuff We think that there are guys or girls standing in a kitchen throwing out plates of food to us But they're the true professors of food mind you most of people out there in the world. They don't know shit about food but these chefs, they really do know about food. So, uh, so we should use their knowledge in order to build new products and definitely get the tastes right. We've seen so many food tech companies out there coming up with new products and the taste doesn't nail it. And then they're gone. I think it's a question of inclusivity as well. So what you're talking about is bringing different ex expertise together. Um, I mean, one TikTok trend that we've seen is uh, date stones. Uh, roasting them, grinding them, and drinking them like coffee, or using them as, as kind of like a powder on top of yogurt or something. That is now being called a superfood, and yet if you look at some of the GCC cultures, that knowledge, even though it's died down, remains with, with the older generations. They know that this is what you do to date stones, they know it's good for you. They don't have the knowledge of what exactly is in it that makes it good for you. And that's where you can bring the scientists in to kind of look at different food cultures and, and why they do things a certain way. There is also a lot of science around the best way to make rice. I'm Kurdish, and it turned out the way that my mother makes it is the kind of the best way scientifically to make rice. It gets rid of the, ni the most amount of niacin. You also get the perfect grain after it. It's not sticky, whatever. And you, she wouldn't be able to tell you this is the best way scientifically to make it. She knows that that just makes good rice. So it's about inclusivity and it's about bringing kind of the different expertise together, I think. In my yeah. uh, did you have a take there? Yeah, so I think it's an interesting question because it's an advantage and a disadvantage of the UE. So the UE is the size of Switzerland or Austria or Holland, it's about the same size population. So I think it's a great testing ground because you have, you know, Pakistani, you have Indian, you have Europeans, you have Americans, you have Emirati, you have Arabs, Lebanese, you know, you have everybody here. But if you want to sell locally, how can you convince, you uh, know, a Swiss like me or a Swedish like you living here to a Lebanese, to a Pakistani, to an Indian. So it's actually, as a market, it's quite challenging because you have to sell to different ending, which very different backgrounds. But again, it's a great exporting and testing ground. Whatever works here, you can be sure that it works globally because you have these kind of, kind of things. Yeah, but there's another thing here. When you talk about the future in a world that's sustainable, there are, there are few things you can really consume with a good conscience in the future, right? But one of those is food. So I, I probably would say that, that a lot of our experiences in the future will move away from space travel, probably towards more food enjoyment. And, and that speaks to uh, the presence of a lot of these chefs that can give that enjoyment to people. Any more questions out there in the audience? Oh, we have oh, several ones. We have the runner with the mic over there. Uh, here is uh, number one in the front, then we have another gentleman in the back after that. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Sriram Gopal and uh, I'm the founder of Future Ag. We are building a hardware agnostic uh, operating system for controlled environment agriculture. Whether it's an indoor farm or a 
greenhouse, you can simply plug and play. So I have a, a kind of a dilemma, right? So which I thought I'd put uh, open to the forum itself. Um, as a technology provider, you often come to a crossroad where you know you want to sell technology as a SaaS business, or do you want to actually um, kind of integrate it? Like, do you want to be a operating system, or do you want to be an Apple or like a closed loop uh, system? And we've never got like a conclusive answer from anybody, right? And I think the the platform here is most uh, suitable for that. SaaS. SaaS. Okay. Simple, SaaS. <laughs> All right. It's 80% gross margin, basically, in subscription, right? And so, yeah. The counter argument normally is, you know, when you go in SaaS, you're just uh, the Foxconn and not the Apple, and uh, you can easily be replaced, and you're always in the back foot. Your valuation is not great. But not everybody is Steve Jobs and can actually sell, right? So you need a lot sure. of money to create an Apple. So I'd rather be a Fox. No, no, I totally agree with Eric. The, the only question is that there are so many, I'm sorry to say, but there are so many people out there wanting to do exactly what you're suggesting, you know, becoming the, the operating system of the, the next gen farm, so to say. And, and the question is, is it a general operating system or is it the strawberry operating system? You know, that's, I think that's where you have your challenge of the, the differentiating. I agree with uh, the gentleman. I would also say that, um, it's just going to be easier to scale with SaaS and to you know establish yourselves in various different markets, and then from there, I mean, it's never cl the, the options are never closed. You know, you can always take that step and and you know brand yourself and become the, the operating system. But I mean, I, there really are so many people out there, and what's what's missing? I mean, as someone who's designing now a beta site for experimental farming. There are so many people out there like us who just want the, the solution, you know. So um, just a final comment on that, right? So uh, at least with respect to ag tech, uh, the hardware itself is not very complex. You know, you put some racks or you put some shelves and put some LEDs. So it's not that defendable. And a lot of people are trying different versions of it, whether it's aeroponic, ebb and flow. Uh, uh, but the real uh, IP is in the software. And like you, uh, you know, said correctly, it's it's uh, how specific can you get to a certain crop or a strain of a, a particular crop. So the whole point is trying to go into a third party farm and trying to sell this takes usually very long sales cycle and huge amount of customizations because it's not like a pure SaaS. It's not just a computer. You have to actually integrate into every single hardware component into a farm. So that's where, you know, uh, sometimes I feel it's much easier to give a complete solution to a farmer and say, hey, you know, you're a small farmer, here's a plug and play solution and then you're done. Um, so that's, you know. It depends on your target consumer. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. The gentleman in the back, perhaps you should give your, uh, your question, the air time it deserves. Thank you. Uh, my question is mainly to Triska and Eric, uh, who probably see a lot of uh, tech startups in the region. Um, in, in terms of building a global food tech hub, as the subject of the uh, uh, conversation right now is, from a regulatory framework, how uh, well equipped is this region, uh, specifically Dubai, in, in terms of enabling uh, young entrepre entrepreneurs or early stage startups to uh, build what is needed to be built? Um, how receptive is the policy making? What sort of incentives do they have as compared to another region or uh, others uh, when using the region itself? Thank you. Should I take that? Okay. So um, even though Dubai is the most expensive city in the world to launch a business, the UAE is the best, or the, the one that um, supports entrepreneurship the most globally, and that's a recent GEM report. Um, the regulatory aspect of uh, launching a startup is incredibly um, pro-entrepreneurship uh, when you compare it to some of the other markets in the region. Uh, this is a country that wants to enable entrepreneurship. It wants startups to make up a bulk of its uh, economy. Um, and the other market I would say is catching up fairly quickly is Saudi Arabia. We're seeing a huge push by its government and its regulators to enable entrepreneurship. And in some cases, in some sectors, they're even more receptive to startups than the UAE is. Um, in the food, food tech and agri-tech business, 
it's it's quite easy. Um, there's a food. It's one of the few countries in the world with a food security ministry. This is a government agenda. They want to enable this sector. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think it's a great place to be to, to launch a food tech or agri-tech business. But with the UAE, it's just an expensive place. So you need that funding. And if you look at the local VC landscape, investment in agri-tech in particular is minimal. The expertise of the VCs just doesn't exist for this sector. And I'm sure Eric will be able to explain a bit more about the investment side. Yeah, I think you said it all. Yeah. But just um, as I think one of the sessions was women uh, in innovation or something, is there any woman who would like to ask a question? I, w I want to just add to that question though. Um, I would say that it's, it's true. Like we work with a lot of pre-seed and like early stage startups. And I think that compared to the rest of the region, this is the best place to do it. With that, compared to Europe and the US, uh, there's still so many hurdles specifically bureaucratic. So uh, starting a company here, like opening a bank account, I mean, there are a lot of entrepreneurs here in the audience, as we saw before, I'm sure you guys know how difficult it is to open a bank account here, uh, or you know, find affordable office space, or like all of this stuff that we deal with with our companies all the time. Um, I think that it's important to talk about these things because uh, while food security and innovation are clearly very high up on the agenda, we need to see the corporate entities and the bureaucratic entities moving in accordance with that agenda. Um, if, if, you need, if it's going to take six months to open a bank account uh, in, in the UAE, you're going to lose so many of your entrepreneurs to the neighboring uh, competitors, especially Saudi. And, and I think that, that, that's also uh, talking about the ecosystem. You really need all the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, in one place at the same time, so the perfect storm, so to say. And that's, that's why it's so necessary that you can get everyone united around a common objective. In this case, it could be really about feeding an urban population in place such as, as Dubai, in a desert set in, setting. And then if you can set all those things, then I mean like, they, then you have the attraction. You, you get this magnetic force on the world that will pull everyone in. And I also think that we shouldn't uh, confuse things here. I mean like, we talk about early stage or you know, the first round, etc. Like those are going north pretty fast. I mean, a, an early stage company these days, I don't know, they're raising enough money to be able to sustain themselves here as well. I think we have 15 billion dollars or something like that flowing into food tech this year. Uh, oh, she's uh, running with the mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge room, you get a lot of exercise. Thank uh, you. Um, hi, my name is Bronte Weir. I'm the co-founder of a UAE-based agri-tech company, um, growing premium specialty mushrooms here. Please in hold the, the mic. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, for co-founder of a UAE-based agri-tech company growing premium specialty mushrooms here in, uh, in, in the UAE. Um, and I just want to pick up on what you said just now, Triska, about the uh, lack of investment on, in, in agri-tech in the region. Um, like, what, what has been done about it and what advice would you have um, to people who are looking for such funding? We're raising the funds. <laughs> <laughs> what is doing? And you've got the um, kind of disadvantage of being a woman as well, because we've seen uh, investment in women-founded businesses is minimal in, in the region. It was 1% last year. Um, so I, I applaud you for doing this in a sector that is not very well funded. Um, what we see is a lot of uh, startups like yours going abroad and seeking out those investors that have invested in similar fields. Um, but there is one, the Vegan Prince. I don't know whether they're here. <laughs> um, I've forgotten the name of, the, of, of his VC, but he's been investing a lot in uh, startups that are in the agri-tech space. Um, you know, the, he's invested in several around the world where they, one that uh, lab grows breast milk, lab grows fish. Um, so there is one investor in the region, but he is yet to make an investment in the Middle East. Are you kidding me? So, so in, in a place such as Dubai, with all that you know, money literally you know, flowing through the air here, you don't invest enough in this space? It's because the investors don't have the expertise in this field. And I have to say, so uh, we're raising a $5 million fund to invest in women-led startups in agri-tech, food tech, and circular economy. So let's talk. 
Um, but at the same time, one of the biggest problems that we found in this process is that there are no beta sites for testing early stage tech in the agri space anywhere in the UAE. Um, and this is something that's going to prevent uh, growth in early stage solutions across the board. So we're also building a beta site in Mazdar City. Eric, how, how, what's the status of food tech investments, or investors rather, here in, in UAE? Yeah, as you said, there's no specialized food tech investor because there's no real food tech here, that's what I meant, right? But, but what I would, um, I think for example, we invest globally. If I see a company that is globally top notch, whenever we invest in a sector, we look at all the companies, right? So if you do, I don't know, an investment in data AI, looking at consumer insight, we look at all of them. If you look at AI, using AI for creating perfumes, aromas, we're looking at all of them, right? So if you are a top-notch company, then you have to select also your investor and KYC, your investor. What are you looking for? You're looking for a seed investor who is local to help you locally. Then I think CAT is the perfect thing, or it's actually um, it's a Saudi prince who is who's the big investor. Khaled? Khaled. Yeah. Khaled is, uh, Ben Walid, something, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's an amazing person, right? Now, if you want to have somebody who connects you globally to the food industry, right, you can go to me as Big Bridge, or you can go to S2G in the US, or you can go to another European VC, right? So you have to also know what you want and choose your investors. And today, everything is on is online, so you find everything. I'll, I'll tell you what's also happening. is the corporates are also starting to take interest in investing or working with startups. So Majid al Futaim is one that has been quite active in partnering with and investing in startups. Um, before, they would have seen you as a competitor. Even if they don't grow mushrooms themselves, the fact that they sell it, they would have seen you as a competitor. But with the pandemic, the mind shift has changed and shifted. So um, I, I would approach someone like Carrefour, perhaps, um, Majid Al Fatim. I mean, go for angels, I think, is, is also uh, pretty, pretty many of those in this town, I guess. I mean, uh, angel investment is, I was actually, we were supposed to talk about this. Um, yeah, I mean, the majority of startups in this region still die in the valley of death. Um, and the amount of early stage angel investment is uh, a real challenge in the ecosystem. Uh, but we do see uh, growing trends in angel investment, especially among women. So 27% of liquid capital in the GCC is in the hands of women. And we see uh, increased interest in uh, getting involved in asset management. So that's... So I'm part of a group of women uh, called 2022 Female Angels. And the goal is to have 2022 female angel investors in the Middle East region by the end of this year. Um, the end goal will be to eventually have a fund that will invest in startups, not just women founded or led startups, but any startups. It's about empowering women who have the, the capital um, to become angel investors. So there's, there's movement, but it's still in the very early stages. I think it's also interesting when you talk about women. The first time I, we, we gathered a, a group of food tech startups in Stockholm, you know, I was up there going up on stage and looking out into the room to welcome everyone. I said, oh my God, there are so many women here, like 50-50 in the room. And if you go to a, a you know, fintech event, uh, you know, you know what it looks like. Uh, only guys in the audience, right? So, so I think there is uh, something to connect women here, both from the investment side and the entrepreneur side. I mean, there are more uh, female STEM graduates in the region than there are men. I think like 60% of all the university STEM students are, are women. The issue is they make up less than 3% of the workforce in, in STEM. Um, so it's a case of enabling um, or providing means to enable women to get into the field and work and there's a whole issue with uh, patenting um, research and uh, commercializing research in the region so it's you need to go back to kind of several steps back before you can have this ecosystem where not just women but like there is that talent and, and that can create the sort of startups that someone like Eric would invest in uh, but Eric, what would you say, what is necessary here in order to, to get more people to pour gold into your pockets uh, or, or somebody else's pockets that would do food tech investments? So, so what, 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 what would, be, would be necessary here in order to have a momentum of food tech investments? Is that a, you know, a unicorn coming out? Or? 
So I think it's a, it's a mentality thing and a success story, right? I think um, Uber, for example, attracted a lot. You know, the success of Kareem to selling his Uber for 3.6 billion actually did a RMX, of course, which you know well, right? Actually made it think, okay, this is, you can make money as a proof of concept. Because don't forget, this region is grown by traders and real estate, right? So mentality is more like a two to three year return where a startup usually takes three to seven years and the fund is a 10 year closed end fund, which is really not the mentality of the local region, right? So it's, it's a mentality to change and it comes with success, I think, if you can show that one food tech company like Pure Harvest, they had a very, very hard time raising in the beginning, yeah, right? They, did. they really did, right? And Sky did an amazing effort and resilience, right? And not all the money comes from here either, right? So um, I think it takes success stories and then people wake up and once the government talks about it also, I think it becomes more aware that this is actually a new asset class. And we actually have a panel next week at the Food for Future, which actually the title is Food Tech as a New Asset Class, together with our partner Edmund de Rothschild, talking about that food tech is now an asset class that you can invest. And even our fundraising, we go now to pension funds. Three years ago, they were like, food tech, what, you know, what is food tech? Now, impact, food, climate change, SFDR, Europe has now an amazing legislation, it's again, greenwashing the financial industry. And you know, now the interest is here. It's, it's, it's really like exponential. I, mean, I don't want to speak for Pure Harvest, but I know that when Sky was uh, raising investment, what he, he was told by most of the VCs in the region was that this is not a tech business. Um, so they, they, you know, even the concept of food tech just didn't really exist when he was, when he was fundraising. I would also add, I think, I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of increased interest even among uh, sovereign wealth funds in the UAE, specifically because of the pandemic and you know, everyone's talking now about food security and the necessity of generating uh, produce locally. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's only a matter, I would say, give it a year or two and we're gonna see uh, the likes of Mubadla and Abu Dhabi Catalyst partners getting involved as well. I think this is cool because one of the stuff, the developments I see is, is of course also that, that, you know, really successful tech entrepreneurs decide that, nah, my next case is gonna be in food tech. So, and then of course, then they bring all their contacts from their old tech world, all their investors on board. They have the credibility on how to scale, how to build stuff, organize. And I think that's a lot of traction we're gonna see going forward. Uh, so, so how, why don't you just you know, talk to the Kareem founders and, and have them go into food tech instead? I mean, with Kareem, the, we published something um, that mapped all the uh, employees that had left Kareem and started their own businesses. Um, some call it the Kareem Mafia, some call it the Kareem Cartel, and there are hundreds. Um, having a success story like that can enable more to develop. Um, again, going back to Pure Harvest, one of the founders has now launched Ocean Harvest. Um, so we're already seeing kind of little spawns emerge. The challenge with that though, I would say, is the the capital and time intensi intensity of these sectors. So like for the success story that we would need to s compare to Karim, uh, it's just gonna take longer, not only to prove the concept and then to scale and then, I mean, and then another thing is that, you know, not all successful ag tech startups exit or like their, their end goal isn't the same as like a software or an IT startup. So like we always talk about rhinos instead of unicorns. I know it's like become a little bit cliche now. <laughs> What's a rhino? A rhino, like the animal? Yeah. yeah. As opposed to unicorn. Yeah. It, it also has one it's horn. It's resilient. So. It, can, it, can, it can outlast, uh, you know, social, political and economic shifts of the region. And it's not necessarily looking to sell for over a hundred million dollars. It's looking to have a, a successful, you know, commercial base in the developing markets of this region. And that could be, you know, if we have enough of those in the portfolio, can, we can end up having a fund that's uh, just as successful. I know. Uh, so so I, I know, Eric, that you have to, to rush to your next, uh, next gig here. And uh, well, you know, I can continue going on talking it's about this forever, next, never, so never, you're never have to leave. until <laughs> until. Uh, you can stay. You can, <laughs> so, you can keep going. So, but, but, but the organizers would need to, to have to have to give us a cue in order to when to stop. We can do it now. We, we can continue, now. Oscar. You're just giving me a you know a premature Christmas gift here. Uh, <laughs> no, we have to wrap up. We've got an in-app and innovation in dining innovation panel yeah. coming up next. So. So, but, but let's have a last question from the gentleman here in the audience. 
I thank you for your uh, very enjoyable discussion. Uh, what I want to know if uh, there is a, an idea which is patentable. Uh, what is patent can be as a patent. Uh, what is your suggestion to approach to VC before patenting or especially in this area in UAE? Uh, do you have any experience or any suggestion? Thank you. Oh, I think, you know, uh, the question of IP and investments here, I, I look at you, Eric, you, you're the guy dealing with investments here. Uh, but generally speaking, of course, having strong IP is a good thing to bring to your potential investors. Um, so you should never forget about that, of course. I think it also depends on uh, what stage you're at in your fundraising. I think if you're raising like a pre-seed or a seed round, it's okay to still be in the registration process. And sometimes the entity that you'll approach will be really helpful in moving that process along. Um, otherwise, you know, if you're uh, if you're Series A and beyond, you should be already registered. I know that there are some new incentives specifically in Abu Dhabi for registering IPs locally here, so uh, check that out. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Eric. Uh, the I mean, IP stands for intellectual property, right? It can be patent, it can be know-how, it can be consumer list, whatever, right? And they stand the former patents, like matter patents, there's process patents, there's design patents. So it all depends what you are. In the food industry, usually it's very hard to get actually matter patents. Um, so, so yeah, uh, you have to decide also, is it better to publish your invention or keep it secret as a state record? You know, so it depends. Okay, lovely. Uh, I think that would have to be the last question, I guess, because you have a new panel coming up, Dr. Triska? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Yes, Eric, thank you so much. Katie, thank you so much. Triska, thank, thank you so much. I thank myself, Johan. <laughs> Good. Thank you, the audience, by the way, as well. Please, please, please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was, that was ah, a no, good fun.